point that you say apply to our government. And it, as you were speaking, I was reminded of um, Canadians kind of during the anti-apartheid movement. And they were able to speak out about that. Under this new bill, um, that actually could be interpreted as supporting terrorism. Um, similarly, if you have strong feelings about um, Palestine or the Ukraine um, and have opinions that are different than your government, then that also could fall under this, this uh, speech crime or the threat to free speech. Um, and so I think, yeah, in my opinion, uh, I would agree with your statement. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Very good. That's excellent. And I, I really agree with your, your reference to Kent, uh, Kent and Roach and Colin for CC. If you just Google R-O-A-C-H and F-O-R-C-E-S-E, -E, you'll find their blog. They've done five in-depth analyses so far, and it's very, very instructive. So thank you for that. Hi, yeah, I'm just curious. Um, do you think that the government will, or individuals, MPs will change their mind if these powers end up being used on them? Um, <laughs> in the U.S., five, five cents did a 180 when she got that the NSA was spying on members of government. So I'm just wondering if you think the same will happen or. Go ahead. Uh, under, under existing law, uh, the government can have spied on Tommy Douglas for 50 years, right? Environmental groups are already being uh, monitored. Control, yeah. I'm not going to call it <laughs> control, but they're already being monitored, and we know uh, very well that some of their activities have been disrupted by the RCMP. So the focus is not on the government. It's on the government directing, uh, either directly, in this case, and I do accuse the government of that, or indirectly, uh, those forces toward the people they perceive as the enemies of Canada because they're the enemies of the government. And that's really very destructive of our democracy. So it's already taking place, and this expands that whole trend. And again, uh, Worrell made reference to the RCMP. Very shocking uh, memo that creates this whole new category of anti petroleum activists and just wants everybody together, me, you, uh, probably everybody in this room gets lumped into the same category as. And then the next sentence is, and violent extremists. So they're already doing this. But I really, I take your rhetorical point, it's a, it's a government, but the government's in charge here. And one of the very disturbing things of the conservative government is we had a tradition of the independence of the RCP and the independence of CCs and agencies. And it's very clear that neither the current commissioner nor the current director of CCs acts independently of this government. I would like to think that there that there could be conservative dissent from this. And now, if you go back just a couple of years ago, there was a bill that was brought in, a uh, government bill, uh, electronic surveillance, uh, which was brought in by then Minister Vic Case, uh, and he renamed it the Child Pornography Bill and said, you know, if you're either with us or you're with the child pornographers, if you oppose this. And actually, all hell broke loose, and not least of which was in the conservative base itself, and people that that were calling in on you know in Alberta uh, talk shows and so on, saying you know what what the hell are they doing, and uh, you know what what business is it of theirs to get? I, I think in some ways it's it they've been trying to rush this bill through so quickly and so much in the dark because they don't want people to actually see it. And that includes their own people as well. And, you know, maybe if we can sort of hold this up long enough and bring up these points that, in fact, maybe some of their own support might weaken a little bit. Not to scare you even further, <laughs> this afternoon I was on the Ian Jessup show and a caller called in and said, this is like the McCarthy era in the 1950s where everybody was a communist and people were worried about reds under the bed and all of that uh, chill, the kind of chill that uh, Laurel talked about. And I said, you know, at one level it's worse. And the reason it's worse is because rather than the word communist, you now substitute the word terrorist. And if you're on this list, what's worse is that 16 government departments now will get all the information in a technology that did not exist in the 1950s. It's called the internet. And all of a sudden, the information about you is available across the Canadian government with no worries about privacy. And then to other agencies, CIA, etc., across the world. So it's a technology that makes it even more frightening. Think about part one, the information sharing provisions of C51. Just another thought. Yes. Yeah. I'm a professor at the University of Victoria. I teach Canada, mainly outside the country. Um, my field is the arts, um, history, and politics. Um, I'm regularly invited to go and talk about Canada outside our country. Um, 
as an aside, and very quickly, the Canadian government under Harper completely cut all funding to all Canadian study centers around the world with a stroke of a pen. And the network that I've been working on for 30 years is very quickly disappearing. We are being isolated from the rest of the world by the Canadian government under Harper. My question is this. Um, I'm actually a visitor. I'm from Spanish. Elizabeth May is my member of parliament. I'm very proud of her. Every so often, she sends around on her Washington, on her website uh, a petition. And if I sometimes decide I want to sign this petition, I bring it up. And when I click on it, on my screen, for a nanosecond, comes up e-activist. And so someone, as you were saying, is keeping very close track of this. Now, for the first time in my long career, I sort of hesitate writing to members of parliament sure. and hesitate to sign Elizabeth May's petitions because it may put me on a no-fly list. And I would like to know what your, you, the panelists, think of this option of me being on a no-fly list if this bill were to pass, just because I have participated in what perhaps might be considered non-lawful dissent. Thank you. Very good question. Greg, Greg Whitaker has done an enormous amount of work on this issue, so I'll turn it over to him. Yeah, I was actually advising the Canadian government on, uh, on airport security and air security. And when the, when the no-fly list first came in, uh, it was specifically, you know, like you say that publicly, but it was to make sure that the American list didn't get applied to the Canadian travel list in the U.S. And they did try to keep it fairly narrow and really said, you know, the only people they were going to keep off planes uh, were the ones that they had good intelligence that they represented about a potential threat to aircraft, not just a potential threat in some general way. That is now gone with this new legislation that goes through. And the vast expanse of the drift net uh, definition of, of of terrorism or threats to security that's in here. Anybody who pops up, I mean, you know, it could be some clueless teenager, you know, uh, putting out something on the internet saying, you know, oh, jihadism is cool, and suddenly, you know, he's, he's on the list. But it could be worse than that. It could, or somebody like yourself, you could say, but it could be worse than that. It could be that you just have the same name as that clueless teenager. And the problem is that it's the air carriers who have to enforce this. And they could actually be subject to action by the government if they fail. And so they're going to cover their butts. And that was one of the problems in the U.S. with the no-fly list. So Senator Edward Kennedy was told we couldn't fly because, you know, maybe they had an IRA suspect or something that was, you know, had that name. Who knows? Um, so, uh, yeah. I think the fears are. I think my concern with the bill is more less about terrorism and much, much more about the establishment of a secret police Canadian spy Hi there. I'm going to echo a sentiment of some of the former questioners uh, and thank you for organizing uh, this town hall. Um, my question uh, to the, the panel is that uh, two things in particular. Um, excuse me, the changing of uh, the term from uh, potential uh, to be threat to the suspect may have the potential to act as a threat, uh, as well as the um, bringing to trial uh, or putting uh, evidence uh, towards a judge uh, without um, a potential to be outside. Strictly is particularly unconstitutional. Is it something that uh, we could in the future, if should this bill pass in its current form, is it something that those two parts in particular we can see the Supreme Court uh, circuit. Thank you. I'll, I'll maybe start with that. I, I think that Dan is dead on. And one of the practical things I'm wondering why the government doesn't immediately do is take those two or three obviously unconstitutional sections and do what's called a reference. Remember they did a reference on the Senate? They did a reference on whether we should have a national securities regulator? Why don't you do a reference on this bill, not all of it maybe, but just the obviously unconstitutional ones, terrorism in general. You know, no one thinks that's going to stand up. The way in which we ask, acting our, I like French's expression, using our police to be kind of, uh, using our courts to be part of the law enforcement apparatus, that's 
totally un-Canadian in, in, in a fundamental way. And so the idea of a reference is one I've been thinking about. And suspend the provisions before we get used to using them and letting them cease and start to use powers which are probably illegal in the first place. So I think that's a, a, a good suggestion myself. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Um, I guess I'm uh, PO of the media. Uh, we don't get any 